We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, there will probably be a few people to enter the room here in the next couple of minutes. That's fine. Uh, we're going to go ahead and welcome you to our webinar, A Framework for Success. This is our second and last webinar in this series, Leadership and in Income Maintenance. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you haven't done so already, please download the handouts by clicking on the link on the slide that you see there. This will open up a PDF version of the handouts in another window in your browser. One of the links in the handouts is to an article that provides more information about the topics we'll discuss today. And the other is a poster that you can print out and hang on your office wall that shows the six steps in the work of a leader, which will be the centerpiece of our conversation today. The first part of this webinar may be a little repetitious from the folks that joined us last week, uh, but we will go through this again. And please bear with us um, if this is a repeat for you. Um, it, it'll be new to some folks. I uh, just wanted to give everybody sort of a background um, on how these webinars came to be offered to you. Um, during a professional capacity committee meeting of the North Carolina Association of County Directors of Social Services, we at the UNC School of Social Work's Jordan Institute for Families were asked if we could provide some training to income maintenance supervisors. Directors understand that much of the resources for training and professional development are available to child welfare and adult, service, adult services, but very little is often available for income maintenance supervisors and workers. And they understand that the challenges that you face are, are extreme, especially currently um, in your jobs and during the time of implementation of NCFAST that your jobs have dramatically changed. We at the Jordan Institute for Families agreed to develop these two webinars for income maintenance supervisors to see how you would receive them and provide some starting point for further conversations about training that you all might be interested in. This webinar is the second of two. The topic areas of both are selected, were selected from a brief survey that was given to a handful of income maintenance supervisors across the state. We really hope it will provide you um, information and that you will find it helpful. And we would love to hear your feedback about it and the ideas for other things that you'd like to see in this format. So please remember to complete the survey at the end of the session. So let's go ahead and get started with just a few technical announcements. If this is your first webinar, um, this will be helpful to you. Uh, many of you have already found the chat box. Uh, this will be our primary way of communicating with you and you with us. You can use this box to send in questions or comments. Uh, we'll try our best to answer all of the questions during the event. There's a lot of folks registered. Um, so in the event that we do not uh, respond to your questions, uh, we will collect those questions in a fact sheet format and email them back out to you with answers after the webinar. Uh, the chat box sometimes moves fast, but don't worry. Uh, we have somebody here that's also tracking all of that information, and um, we'll be able to, to keep up with it that way. Um, you will also see that there are um, there's a tiny little box right above the chat pod with little lines on it. And if you click or hover over that, it says pod options. And if you click on that, a little menu comes up that says one of the options you can select is start chat with. Um, and you can choose hosts or presenters. Um, either one of the, if you click the host um, button, it will lead you to the folks that are in charge of our technical support here, John McMahon and Philip Armfield, and they are available to help you should anything happen technology-wise um, that, that you can, that you might need help with. Um, so please feel free to, to ask for that kind of assistance if you need to. Um, also, you'll notice at the top of your screen there's a little man with his arm raised. Um, and there's also an arrow beside him or her. And if you click on that, uh, you can do a, a lot of other things um, to interact with us, including agreeing or disagreeing, or you can tell us that you've stepped away from your uh, computer. Uh, the raise hands is a, you know, a, you can also um, 
do that to, to wave or say hi, um, as well as if you have a question. So please feel free to use those if you'd like. And I'm just going to go ahead and get started with the first slide and let you know what our goals for today are. Um, and as you can see from this slide, we have uh, three goals. Um, and, uh, of course, our ultimate goal that, that remains uh, the same from last week. So today we hope that by the end of our 90 minutes together that you will have a greater understanding of what's required of leaders during times of change. Um, that you will learn and understand the six strategic steps defining the adaptive leader's work. And thirdly, which you can't actually see all of, um, but that says uh, generate ideas about how to put these six steps into practice. And so we'll be doing that as, as a group um, throughout um, our time together today. Of course, the ultimate goal is to help you navigate changes to supervision in income maintenance. Specifically, today's agenda, we're going to go over orientation and introducing ourselves to you. Um, we are also going to talk about the heart of leadership, which again will be a little bit uh, redundant from last week, but new to some folks with us today. And then we're going to proceed into talking about the work of the leader and um, practice with examples. And our, our, we'll do that at the end, but we'll also be asking for um, examples and comments throughout our, our webinar today. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to um, my esteemed colleague uh, and friend that I have here with, with me today. Um, I'd like to welcome each of you that have signed on for today's webinar. My name is Christine Howell, and I am a clinical assistant professor for the Jordan Institute for Families. Again, our technical help is provided by my colleagues Philip Armfield and John McMahon here at the Jordan Institute for Families. And I would love to introduce to you today our guest presenter, we are so pleased to have with us Catherine Williamson Hardy. Catherine comes to us from Durham DSS and is currently an assistant director there. Along with being an excellent leader, she also has a great a wealth of experience in income maintenance. Catherine, I'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself. Good morning, everyone. Um, to give you a little different information than what I shared um, last week, I guess it's important for this webinar for you to know that I've been um, working at social services for a little over 25 years. And I started as an income maintenance caseworker, worked in Medicaid, work first, and daycare. I've also been a supervisor, program manager, and assistant director in local um, DSSs in Maryland and in North Carolina. And I've spent um, about eight years traveling the country, visiting um, different DSSs, providing leadership training. And so I'm hoping that um, from that experience, I have a very good perspective about what is needed, the questions and the wonderings that, that we all have trying to do this work. Um, I'm learning every day. And just excited about spending this next 90 or so minutes with you, sharing with you some of my experiences and um, learning through this webinar. So excited to get started, Chris. I'll just go ahead and tell you as we start today that uh, um, our disclaimer is that we're not NPR or NBC, and so um, we make mistakes as we go along. I probably more than anybody, um, and I am constantly having to be reminded to turn on my mic or turn off my mic. So if you have brief uh, moments of uh, pauses, uh, that's, that's because I didn't turn my mic back on. So thanks for your patience in advance. Um, at this point, I just want to go ahead and uh, uh, do a polling question to get us started, and this will let us know how many folks uh, we have that joined us last week. So the question is, did you participate in the first webinar of this series last week called Solving and Aligning Technical and Adaptive Problems? I figured many of you had. So we've got about 83% Oh, I'm sorry, 87 percent, 86 individuals. Yeah, the majority of you. Okay, great. 
Well, that's wonderful. Um, it is not a prereq. It was not a prerequisite for our webinar today. So, if you're joining us for the first time, um, that is completely okay. Uh, it does relate to what we talked about last time, and um, that webinar is also recorded for you on the FCR website, FCRP website. And so, if you'd like to go back and look at that, if you missed it, uh, you can feel free to do that. Thank you. So let's just get started um, again today uh, talking about the context of our work as income maintenance supervisors. Um, when we talk about supervision in income maintenance today, I think we all understand that we are talking about a very challenging job. Some of the challenges of being a supervisor now are related to the realities that you see on this screen. And, and these realities have come from many folks that we've talked to um, across the state. And that is really that the work of income maintenance has changed dramatically. The traditional leadership structures have changed, and customer service is now such a critical element of the work that you do, as is managing stress. Um, and, and that is just so imperative for not only you as supervisors, but also for you at, in dealing with your workers. Um, and so, Catherine, I'm wondering if you can elaborate on these changes a little bit and add any others that you think are helpful in creating a picture of where income maintenance is right now and what supervisors in this area are facing. Sure, Chris. When we were trained on the difference between adaptive and technical change and or challenges in Durham, one of the videos that was shown to us was Permanent White Water by Stephen Covey. Many of us uh, were aware of Covey because of his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he's also done a lot of work in the realm of leadership. And in his video, he uses permanent white water to illustrate the power of changes and challenges that we face. He uses the image of the coming down a raft and you're in the midst of white water. So I'm just going to invite everyone to stop for a moment and get that visual in your head. Think about being on a raft in the middle of Russian white water. The water is rough, it's moving fast, it's changing directions, and you are just trying to stay afloat. Sounds familiar? I call it Lake NC Fast. As we find ourselves in the middle of these rapids, we can't wait for someone to instruct us on what to do. We have to rely on our instincts and take action to survive. That's the same thing we've had to do when we face the challenge, the challenge and changes that came with NCFAS. They've been quick, intense, and quite complex. What we need to do based on Covey is to anchor ourselves in what he calls a changeless core and hold on to what we know to be true, to ground ourselves enough to operate during times of uncertainty. We have to be okay with uncertainty. There's no doubt about it. And we can't be paralyzed by it, nor look for someone to give us the answer, the right answer, the never changing answer, because that's not the reality that we work in. By holding on to a changeless core, it gets us through these rapids and gives us enough foundation to be okay during the transition period that comes with change. It also equips us to build new realities, and it helps us to come to terms with what those new realities have to be, and gives us the strength and the energy to try to lead our staff through these turbulent waters. Let's digress a moment and look at this changeless core that Covey is talking about. He defines this as principles and values. That's right, right, Catherine, and I love your analogy of the white water. Everybody that I've shared that um, with has has absolutely said that that's exactly what it feels like. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in terms of the principles and values, if you could share with us a little bit more about the Changeless Core um, and what you've experienced in Durham and what you all rely on at Durham DSS um, uh, in terms of your principles of partnership. 
Absolutely. As we shared last week, we used the six principles of partnership, and I'm going to um, ask everyone that was with us last week to just indulge me for a moment because I think it's important to um, highlight these principles for those who are just joining us for this webinar. The six principles of partnership that we use in Durham County are everyone desires respect. Um, and that's about the fact that everyone has an innate desire to be respected. And that before our staff want to know what we know, they want to know that we respect them. And so that's work around showing up respect in a respectful manner. Everyone needs to be heard is the second principle. And remember we talked last week that that means everyone wants to be understood. So it's not just the act of listening, but it's the work of really trying to understand someone. I heard someone said that compassion was listening to someone long enough that you understood their perspective. And everyone has a desire for that. The third is everyone has strengths. As I shared last week, each one of our staff, each person who works in our agency has a strength. And the more we can identify that and connect that to the work that needs to be done, the stronger our agencies are because people work up to their strengths. Everyone has strengths. The fourth is judgments can wait. First, we have to acknowledge that we make judgments. And sometimes that's challenging for us to do is to acknowledge that. This principle is not asking us to refrain from making judgments, but it's asking us not to make judgments in concrete. It wants us to make judgments light enough so that when new and relevant information comes our way, we can process it and tweak our judgments accordingly. Judgments can wait. The fifth is partner share power. If we're going to work collaboratively with other people, we have to figure out how to share our power with them. Whether it's real power or perceived power, we have to learn how to lower that power enough so that other people can see themselves having a voice, having a place at the table. And the last one is partnership is a process. That all of these principles work together that none of us are going to get them right every day, that it's a process that you pay attention to and that you be intentional about trying to, to operationalize these principles. So those are the six principles that we use, the values that we use in Durham County to anchor ourselves and to become a part of our changeless core. Thanks, Catherine. And that really leads us right into the heart of leadership because we believe, and as Heifetz wrote in his work, that this changeless core of principles and values really is at the heart of leadership on a very personal level, individual level, as well as an organizational level. And as we discussed in the first webinar, and I think it be bears repeating here, all leadership really does begin with the heart. And this means that knowing yourself understanding your own strengths and weaknesses as a leader, and developing your own leadership stance is the first part of leading. This allows us to mobilize and motivate others. Our challenge as leaders is to continually integrate our skills, our resources, and our energy into a personal leadership stance. As Catherine says, it's a way of showing up or behaving in our workplaces and with the people that we support. Absolutely, and it's so imperative to do that given the rapid white water change that we all experience every day in the income maintenance world. These principles and values that make up our changes core must be embraced and embodied if we're going to strive to be good leaders. And it's not just the folk who have titles, but in our changing environment, it requires leadership from everyone. Everyone needs to show up differently when there is an adaptive challenge or change. So it's imperative for us as supervisors, managers, to invite the leadership out of everyone in our agency so we all take responsibility for the success. 
That's right. And just to sort of recap a little bit from last week as we move into the work of a leader, it's important for us to frame a little bit and remind those that participated last week about the difference between technical and adaptive work. And if you look at this chart here, um, you can see that these uh, what we're talking about in terms of these two challenges, and these are present in any kind of change. Uh, these are adaptive um, and technical. And for folks who were not with us last week, and as a refresher for those who were, let's just briefly review these different challenges. Um, Catherine, can you help us with that? Sure. Um, technical challenges are those that are clearly defined and have known solutions if not by you, then by someone. They also require the leader to be an expert and to take primary responsibility to solve these changes and challenges, as you can see on the chart. Adaptive challenges are those that are not clearly defined, those that do not have a known solution, and those that require stakeholders to craft a solution. And remember we talked about last week that stakeholders are not just the income maintenance staff, but they're also your reception staff, your call center, the staff who processes the, your mail for NCFAS. Anyone who has a role to play in the work is a stakeholder and coming up with solutions for adaptive um, challenges and changes. And so as we think about the survey that you took last week, we're saying now in the world of income maintenance, most of our work is adaptive. So today we're, we're, um, focused, we're going to focus on that adaptive side of the chart. Um, we're going to explore some tools and methods that can help us navigate the rapid waters that come with adaptive changes and challenges. That's exactly right. And so Heifetz calls this actually the work of the leader. Um, and in order to be successful in conquering these adaptive challenge, he says that there are six strategies that we must do in order to, um, to work effectively as leaders. At this time, before I, we talk about those six, um, I want to do another polling question. Okay, so this one is, in my organization, there is an exception, um, there is an expectation, I'm sorry, expectation that as a supervisor, part of my job is to develop leadership in members of my staff. Is that something you, a statement you would strongly agree with or strongly disagree with or anywhere in between? That's great to see. Most of you have already responded that it really is an expectation of you to develop leadership amongst your staff, and that's, that's a very positive indicator um, that things are moving in, in a great direction in terms of expectations as, of you as a supervisor. That's great. Thank you. And so, when we talk about the work of a leader, I'm curious, this, this slide indicates that there are really two sides of the same coin in terms of actions and beliefs. Catherine, before we walk through the steps, what does the work of a leader mean to you? It really means to me aligning your beliefs and actions together so that you can manage doing a, a changing environment. It means that you hold on to your changeless core as you lead staff through what is often very turbulent waters. That's why I love the term um, how you show up. That's what it means to me. It means that do your beliefs and actions reflect the way you show up. That's great. And so let's really begin. Um, I'm hoping you can help us, help take us through how we actually do this work. And so here we have the six strategies of the work of a leader. Yes, the, the, there are six strategies that define the work of a leader. The first is getting on the balcony. Second is identify adaptive challenges. Third is to regulate distress. Fourth, maintain disciplined attention. The fifth is to give the work back to the people, the stakeholders. And sixth, be open to all voices. 
That's great. We're going to take these uh, one at a time, and so we're going to start with the first one, getting on the balcony. Um, and it sounds like an interesting metaphor. I can see how getting on the balcony can really help us see the big picture, identify conflict, patterns, strengths, and reactions to change. But the question is, how do we get on the balcony, especially when some of us are only on one floor? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it can be challenging. You actually need to remove yourself emotionally and conceptually from the work on the ground in order to get a different, larger vantage point. The metaphor really illustrates how on the balcony you can observe all the things that you can't see when you're on the floor dancing or you're with the dancers. When you get on the balcony, you can see patterns, who is dancing with whom, who's in conflict, what patterns are emerging, all these things can help you clearly help you all these things you can clearly see from the balcony and help you um, develop a big picture about what tasks are in front of you and what needs to be done. So how does it really look in reality? I mean, how do you actually do it? You know, I don't believe there's no one way to do it. I think it looks differently for each person. Um, personally, I asked myself this um, question. I said, what if I didn't think I had the answer? What would I ask? Who would I seek advice from? Who would I bring to the table? That helps me to get myself mentally to the balcony and open myself to different perspectives. I found when you think you already know, you stop learning. You stop look looking. So I mentally ask myself these questions to stretch myself and get to the balcony. Um, there are also some other techniques that, that you can try. It's all about finding um, what works for you. What will help you pull yourself out of the weeds enough to be able to listen at a different level to grow your perspective. Now the reality is we all have to get in the weeds at times, but the danger is when we stay there and we don't pull ourselves above it to understand different perspectives. If you go back to everyone needs to be heard, which means everyone wants to be understood, they want you to understand their perspective, that's the type of listening that I'm talking about. One other um, tool I use is to ask myself wondering questions. Um, it's a really good way to do this. It will slow you down enough to remember to get on the balcony and to get a different perspective. For example, sometimes I'm in a meeting and I hear a statement being said, and as bad as I want to say, what? Why did you say that? Or, you know, that won't work. I have to control my internal voice, and instead I reframe my thoughts, and I said to the person, I'm wondering how you feel that approach, that idea, you know, fill in the blank, will help us achieve whatever the discussion is about. I invite you to try this. When you find yourself wanting to say why, change that word to I'm wondering and see how that will open you up to getting a bigger picture and help you to get on the balcony. Just, just try it. Every time you find yourself wanting to ask someone why, instead of using why, say I'm wondering, and then fill in the blank, whatever that statement is, and see if it helps you to broaden your perspective, because it often helps the person that you're talking to share more about what they're thinking, more of their point of view. I found when people don't feel like they have to defend their position, but rather share, they're more open to giving you more of what they're thinking. So that's what I do to get on the balcony. Those are some great tools that you just shared with us, Catherine, and, and some of them are just mental tools that we need to, to do internally. So at this point, before we go to the second step, I'm going to ask all of you, using your chat boxes, please share with us one way you get on the balcony or something that you do that helps you to get on the balcony.
I think asking questions um, are oftentimes really good ways to allow us just a pause to remember that we need to take a broader perspective. Um, so asking questions are often really good tools. So the question is, how do you get on the balcony? What helps you to get on the balcony? OK, so Minnie says um, she places herself in the worker's position. Um, that's great. That's, that's, a, that's a good uh, mental exercise. Um, sometimes use the miracle question to see the big picture, Dan Comer. Very nice. Let uh, everyone's thoughts and opinions marinate before answering. And that's right. So if you can just remember to pause a little bit. And these are all coming very quickly, so I'm just going to pick out a few of them. We send out surveys to get worker uh, to get their feedback. Um, that's a great way to get a larger perspective about what's going on. Thanks for that. Um, walk around offices and see what's going on and ask them questions. A really hands-on approach. That's right. And that's a way of really sort of reserving judgment, too, I think, Catherine. Would you agree? Abs absolutely. A very good way. We have uh, weekly meetings to allow staff to share their ideas and thoughts. Um, very nice. Ditto for New <laughs> Hanover. Good. Um, hold a work session to brainstorm on problem solving. That's exactly right. And, and so don't forget to involve the stakeholders in that process, because the people closest to the work are often the ones that have the best answers. Continue to get feedback from staff. Very good. So lots of different tools in terms of um, getting feedback and different perspectives from staff. Observe the process with a mindset that leaves out how it should be done to see what is being done and working well. Good. Working from a strengths perspective, for sure. OK, just another minute. There we go. Uh, we have fast meetings to cover new processes. We've heard that from many counties, too, just those yes. quick meetings that happen weekly, uh, very quick. Some people say they even have them standing up. That's how quick they are. So. <laughs> OK, we're going to move on. Um, thank you all for participating in that. We'll, we'll uh, have a chance after each one of these to allow you to share your uh, strategies and examples. Um, so moving on to the uh, second step of the work of the leader is identifying adaptive challenges. Um, and this is where, so by getting on the balcony, it can help us to actually see or sort through um, what adaptive and technical challenges are. So to sort out which is which, because we know that these occur uh, together in any change that, that we're involved with. So looking for things like conflict in values and relationships can lead us to identify an adaptive challenge. And then making it a point to actually name it as adaptive is helpful to everyone, especially since we already know with adaptive challenges, we will need to bring everything everyone to the table to help create solutions. Uh, this sounds like a lot to track just for one step of change. Catherine, can you take us through this a little bit? Yeah, it is very challenging to, um, to track it and make sure that you're um, bringing everyone to the table, but it's so necessary. So you really want to make sure that your values and practice and, and relationships are in line. And when your values and beliefs are misaligned, it is really hard to move everyone forward. Um, it, it makes the work so much more challenging. And so this step is a really about looking at relationships, the hard piece that we talked about earlier. Um, as a leader, you want to inspire and move your team to a collective call to action. Um, you want everyone to have a sense of responsibility to solve the problem. Then, of course, you want to make sure, to the best of your ability, that you can provide your staff with what they need to move forward. And that's been one of the real um, challenges in NCFAST, because we, we felt ill-equipped that we didn't have what we needed. And yet, we have to look at what we have and make the best of it. So you evaluate your training. You look at what your expectations are of the work based on the new reality that we find ourselves in. And you then you need to begin to pay attention to relationship, 
that piece of how people work together and can we um, productively communicate. Um, you want to build trust. Um, when you are really on shaky ground and everything is not um, absolute, you can't dot every I and cross every T, you can't go to the manual or go to the internet and find the policy to tell you what to do, the trust and communication piece becomes more imperative because you have to walk together in this unknown environment um, and you have to deal with these adaptive challenges without Keep in mind the definition of adaptive challenges without anyone having the answer. So it's about building supportive relationships in the workplace that help us show up and be our best even when the environment is not conducive to that. Yes, you've hit on a lot of things um, in in that that statement connecting um, how you identify adaptive challenges. And I really think, through my experience, that relationships are the hardest part of change. Can you give us an example from Durham um, when you've experienced values and beliefs not being in alignment? Wow, that's a hard question. Uh, so values and beliefs not being in alignment. Um, I think with NCFAS, um, we've struggled with trying to move forward in spite of a lot of unknowns. Um, at times, we felt paralyzed by what we did not know. And we've had some difficult, challenging conversations assessing what was happening in our agency. Um, and as I shared in the first webinar, the reality in the income maintenance world is that we value hard skills, technical knowledge, the ability to know the policy and apply it correctly and timely. And because of that value, we believe those who knew it the best should be rewarded by, by elevating that person as expert or supervisor, manager, or etc. So now fast forward and we are in the NC fast world and we're telling ourselves and our staff that although this is what we value, you have to believe that you can be successful without having that kind of knowledge. You have to be, you have to be okay with redefining what expertise means in this new world. So we, we learned um, that in order to get our values and our beliefs back in sync, we had to stop and honor the loss that we all felt and pay attention to the person. We had to validate that there was a loss. We had to talk about losing that sense of identity. We need to help ourselves and our staff see that while we might not have the same level of expertise, we still brought a wealth of knowledge and experience. And those were transferable skills that would assist us in being successful in this new world. So we now have to value a person's willingness to enhance new skills, willingness to learn. We have to, as supervisors, um, enhance our own skills. I thought it was interesting, the poll about how many of you said that you have responsibility to grow your staff and um, provide them leadership skills. and Therefore, you have to grow your own, own skills. That's something we all have to take responsibility for. So now we have to look at how, do I how am I as a facilitator? Do I um, lead by example? Am I asking the right questions? Do I con convene the right folk around the room to address a need? Um, all of this is a different way of looking at how we show up in the, in the workplace. This has been challenging for us. It requires attention, but it, it has helped us to acknowledge that our values were based on technical skills, hard skills, and now we have to shift, shift those values. And while those skills are still important, there are new skills that we have to grab hold to. And we have to believe that by doing that, we can be successful in this transition period between where we were as it relates to being income maintenance managers, now we're in a transition period, and where we need to be as it relates to all of us being successful in this new way of working. So 
that's an example that I think um, might resonate um, with folk because I know we're not alone in what we have experienced. I think what you just said probably resonates um, with everyone that's on the call. Um, a colleague of yours from Durham says, this sounds like a lot of work, but we can't afford not doing it. And she's exactly right. Um, the adapt And that really is what the adapt, one of the big adaptive challenges in any kind of change that we face is um, dealing with those alignment of values, that shift in culture that has a lot to do with not only how we show up, but how we relate to one another. I'm going to invite each of you um, at this time to use your chat box and share with us what an adaptive challenge is for you right now. So can you identify what an adaptive challenge is that you're dealing with um, currently in your work? and use your chat box to share that with us. A huge workload. That's right. Um, it sounds somewhat technical, but there are lots of adaptive pieces to figuring out how to solve that problem. You're right, and there's lots of um, relationship issues as well as um, values alignment going on there. Uh, letting go of EIS. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah. it's our old system, and so we have to embrace our new system and NC fast. <laughs> Losing knowledgeable staff or some other things, uh, dealing with multi-program IMCs, uh, redundancy. Yes, having to learn so many um, programs because traditionally you've been um, tasked with really being the expert of one program, for example, food and nutrition. But now you might find yourself having to have um, food, nutrition, and Medicaid, and you're trying to lead without having that expertise for all programs. That's right. Um, there's also folks that are um, saying uh, staff turnover, uh, how to deal with supervision issues, just supervising employees, um, what else, dealing with the stress that comes along with NCFAS, absolutely, and that's been a huge um, issue that I think lots of counties are dealing with, um, and we will talk about that actually in our, our next slide um, on um, regulating distress. Uh, conflicting and constantly changing advice instructions from the state that hamper any type of planning. It's true. And, and planning by nature is somewhat technical. So we really have to count on those sort of our changeless core because of the, cha the amount of change that the instructions alone are, are providing for us. A lot of whitewater there. Absolutely. And all of these statements really um, sound familiar. And one of the things I would invite you to do is to um, do exactly what you're doing now by identifying what some of those adaptive challenges are and to drill down and pull out what is technical about that challenge and address those. Those are like the low-hanging fruit issues that you can get some wins and feel good about and help you to move forward and then be able to spend the time, energy, and the intellect around the adaptive part of that challenge. So I just invite you to think about how to break um, the issues down enough so they feel workable to you because in every challenge there are technical and adaptive um, components. So if you address the, adapt the technical side of it, get some wins, help you and your staff to feel good about what you've accomplished so you can build the energy to focus on that adaptive side of the coin. That's perfect um, and, and great advice about adaptive uh, challenges. We're, we're just going to move on here um, to regulating distress. Um, and, and Robeson County, 
Robeson, Robeson County uh, staff are stressed to the point of emotions flaring, so they are unable to receive the positive advice you try to give and no longer want to hear what they need to embrace the change or that they we are here to help. Absolutely. I mean, after a while, um, everyone shuts down. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about how, as a supervisor and a leader, you regulate distress. Um, the under regulating distress, we have two bullets. One is creating a holding environment, and the other is maintaining personal composure and regulating emotion. And so just having to deal with adaptive challenges and change means that there is a lot of stress and distress uh, for, for management and for supervisors. Um, and so I'm curious, Catherine, what does it mean to create a holding environment? It can be a physical space or a mental or emotional space. Um, their difficult challenges can, where difficult challenges can be discussed. Um, you know, so look around your um, agency and think about where do I hold my meetings. Is there a space that I can hold a meeting or have a conversation that just changes the physical environment enough that that helps to create an environment that can relieve some some stress. Um, you want to welcome diversity of opinions. Often um, people around the table feel stressed because they don't feel that their opinion is being heard. And again, I go back to what I said in the first webinar. Hearing someone's opinion Understanding their perspective does not mean you agree with it. And as supervisors, I know we walk a tightrope around that because we want to be clear that I hear what you're saying. I get your perspective. You want to give them back verbiage to show them you get their perspective. But you can also not agree with it. And, and that's a, a delicate dance, and I appreciate that. You know, experiences and values and assumptions are asked for and challenged. You, you, you want to make sure we're just not assuming that we have to do a certain thing or be in a certain situation because that's the way it's been done or those are some of the assumptions that we have. But you want to um, challenge some of those. It, it gives your staff um, the feeling that you are willing to be innovative and support and push the envelope as much as you possibly can. And, and I, I want to go back to what Robeson um, County said. Be transparent with your staff. Stress is expected. It's expected, and we have to tolerate it. And, and, it's, and it's a, we have to be appropriately transparent as managers to, to say that it's OK. Um, and so you want to really um, normalize the stress that they're feeling and appropriately share your own stress so that um, your staff recognize that it's a normal emotion based on what all we all have experienced. So those are some of the, um, the steps that I would invite um, folks to think about when, when they're looking at trying to hold the environment. And so the second, oh. and so the so second the point, I think, is equally as hard and especially for expressive people like myself how do you maintain personal composure and regulate distress uh, regulate your emotion well not being an expressive person i wouldn't be able to speak <laughs> <laughs> those who know me know how untrue that statement is <laughs> um, as an expressive person i can confirm that that is quite hard and sometimes it feels a little disingenuous, um, and yet it is so necessary um, for us to do as leaders because if we are emotional, the energy that comes from that is absorbed by everyone in the room, and it can really um, be difficult for other folk to be in the room and show up, show up their best. Um, as a leader, we must try to defer our personal emotional responses. Um, because it brings about distress, um, and it really gets in our way um, to facilitate finding solutions. As I'm thinking about this, when I was training and facilitating how to have difficult conversations, I'm remembering some tools that I used um, 
that I think we could use as supervisors when we're having meetings. Um, one was a remote control. I, I know it sounds silly. But what we agreed um, during these difficult meetings was to put a picture of a remote control in the middle of the room. Um, and when, when we either needed time to find our words because the emotion was really getting to us or we needed to restate something that we had said, we simply reached out on the table and picked the remote control and said, pause or rewind. Um, and it was a way for us to be transparent about the fact that we misspoke or that we needed some time to um, really get ourselves together. Um, another tool is we use was oops and ouch. Yes, oops and ouch. Um, and how we use that is that we agree that if I'm sitting in a meeting and my emotions have gotten the best of me, and I've said something that um, two minutes ago that I'm still thinking about because I didn't want to say it that way or I realized how it impacted the room, that I can simply say to the room, I have an oops. And everyone knows what oops means. That means that I said something that I want to restate because it's not setting well with me. Vice versa, if I'm sitting in the room and someone says something that hit me so hard that we are five minutes down in the conversation, I'm still thinking about what they said, that I can say I have an ouch. And I have a responsibility to state what that ouch was and why it was that way. That helps everyone to understand how people are experiencing the room. And it helps us be able to main, uh, maintain some composure. So these are just a couple of techniques that I've used in the past that I invite you to think about and try or something else is all about being transparent that we all have emotions, we all need to regulate our emotions and that sometimes they get the best of us. Um, and as we build relationships, the more transparent we can be about that and work to manage them, the better the outcome. Absolutely, and uh, we've got a couple of comments posted here, so I'm just going to um, respond to those very quickly. I think, Rebecca, you're absolutely right. It is a balance, and I think that the tools that Catherine um, just shared with you, the oops and the ouch and the remote control, are a way to achieve that balance. It's not that we don't show up with emotion. Of course we do, but 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 it's regulating that emotion. So so when when is it okay and when is is it not okay? And, and finding terms like oops and ouch to actually be very transparent about those emotions that we're carrying. Um, and then uh, there's another comment. Uh, the question to you, Catherine, has that been successful? Yes and no. Um, these are all tools. There, there is no magic dust um, to doing this kind of work. And there have been times that it has been extremely successful and other times that it has not worked as well. And I go back to these are tools just like in a um, mechanics toolbox. You have a, a whole range of tools, not one tool you can use for every job, every situation. So that's what I invite you to think about, that um, these are one or two, three tools that I'm sharing with you. And you want to be developing additional tools, because not one tool will work for every situation. But yes, I have um, had success using these. And initially, it might feel funny, different. Even your staff may say, oh, you're, you're trying something new. You've been to training. I would say, yes, I have, and thank you for noticing because I'm trying to grow and develop. So own that, own that because we're all growing, and we have to be willing to step out and try something different. Absolutely. I'm going to invite you all um, quickly to just post any tools that you're currently using that are very helpful um, to you in regulating the stress, whether it's for yourself or for your workers. What tools do you use? So go ahead and share those with us. Uh, 
I'm going to start using the remote control. I like that one. <laughs> Okay, exercising during lunch, that's a great way to alle alleviate stress and also, you know, provide uh, good modeling for a uh, healthy lifestyle. That's a great example. I need to, um, to do that myself. Uh, being proactive and asking staff how they are feeling in the midst of challenging times. It's true. You know, we talk about this in a lot of the trainings that we do. Sometimes just the fact that you asked about how somebody is feeling is all they really need to hear. They just need to know that you care enough to ask, that you're attending to their needs, um, their emotional needs, and that really goes a long way. Yeah. Absolutely, that goes back to attending to the person. Um, we have to do that more because often the work overtakes everything and we lose sight of the person. Absolutely. Uh, we have used, oops, went so fast. Good communication, certainly, yes. Um, lead by example, asking staff if there's something they need in order to accomplish their goals, and working on meeting that need if one is identified. Very good. So honoring agreements is a, is a big part of that. We do a pit and the peach, or a rose and the thorn at each weekly hurdle. I love that. Um, just a, another metaphor for what's working, what's been challenging. Um, uh, so you end on a positive note, you do the peach last. Good. We do a staff appreciation day, ice cream social. Very nice. OK. Just one more here. I've heard the Obamas do rose and thorn at dinner every night. <laughs> That's great, John. <laughs> All right. Sandy, go ahead and finish, and we'll, okay, we had a huge cake made in the shape of an elephant, and staff were invited to eat the elephant. Oh, I love that, <laughs> And see fast, one bite at a time. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very good. All right, we're going to move on um, in the, the uh, um, because of time constraints here. Moving on to number four, maintaining disciplined attention. Um, and this is step four in the work of a leader. So this is about, um, as Heifetz explains to us, not avoiding disturbing issues, exposing conflict and using it to produce creativity, um, and identifying distractions and regaining focus on goals. I know in my experience that when problems are hard to define and solutions are not known, I can get fairly distracted pretty easily and begin chasing things like squirrels um, mm -hmm. that, that do not further our work or, or keep, keep me spinning my wheels. So I'm curious here, though, that to maintain disciplined attention as a leader, you must also not avoid disturbing issues. You're supposed to expose conflict, all the while helping people to focus on goals. That seems like a lot to ask. It, it is, because a lot of us, by nature, are conflict avoiders. And yet, in this situation, we cannot afford to do that. We cannot um, deny that there are problems. You know, doing complex changes, it is common to want to focus on the technical work, um, the stuff that we can readily find a solution um, for and get it done. But the reality is that we have to deal with what I call the messy stuff, like relationships, communication, trust, those things that are not um, so obtainable. Because if we only deal with the technical work, what will happen is that we will be working above the wave. But that strong current is still running under the wave. And eventually, we'll get pulled down. Um, and we will be, and we will think that the waters were calm, but we didn't go deep enough and deal with the real work that's on the wave, the conflicts, the um, issues that really will determine the success or failure of whatever we're trying to accomplish. So it sounds like from this that um, leaders are really supposed to use conflict for good. Is that right? 
Yeah, I know it sounds a little counterintuitive. Um, I'm a person that gets energized by discourse. Um, so um, it's like take that energy that comes from it um, because often what happens is that's when people are creative. And creativity is what we need to solve complex problems. Um, to move through complex changes, we need to be creative, think um, creatively, and together come up with innovative solutions. And it's hard to do that um, when we're working in status quo and that everyone is in agreement and no one is challenging or pushing the envelope. Um, so the next time you're in a room and you hear that dissenting voice, a person who's presenting a difference with, of opinion with passion, um, you know, look at that as energy and try saying to them, wow, you have a lot of energy around that issue. Um, and use again the wondering question. I'm wondering how you would, and fill in the blank, whatever you're trying to get accomplished, ask that person with that um, energy that comes from them thinking differently how they would accomplish it. And then invite other voices um, around the room. And what you begin to develop is synergy. And then take that synergy and build a greater solution that's bigger than any one or two um, people's thoughts. That's the beauty of having people around the table. So look at conflict as energy that develops new ideas, and then take those new ideas to move forward. I love that image and that concept. So at this point, um, I'm going to ask all of you to share what tools you use to deal with conflict on your teams. What has worked for you in dealing with conflict? See, they all have their ideas ready to go now that we, we've been, they've gotten, they've, we've, we've trained them very well. Or they're just quick learners. They're quick learners, that's right. <laughs> very quick. Drill down to the emotion behind the issue. We ask workers for solutions when they have a problem. Uh, that's right. And so how would you serve, uh, solve this problem? Owning mistakes is a big one. And making it OK to, as you said last week, fail forward. Yeah. Uh, always in forward progress, but failing is OK. Listening to staff to get to the root of problems and achieve, um, create achievable goals, absolutely. Let's see if we have another one pop up here for us. Ask how they would handle it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so engaging them in the solution finding to the problems that they might identify. Yes, and you know, think about the sandwich technique when you're doing that. Um, ask them first how they would handle the situation. You know, then feel free as the manager, the supervisor, in the middle to add some of your thoughts, and then come back and ask them last. Um, that sandwich techniques often make make folk around the room feel like you really do want to hear how they would handle the problem. You really are willing to share your power and give them a voice in coming up with a solution. So think about the sandwich technique. Ask them first and last. You know, how would you handle it? Have this discussion in the middle, and then say, now based on what we've heard in the room, do you want to add anything else to what your initial thoughts were? Absolutely, and I love um, Buncombe County um, just chatted here <laughs> that they try to treat it as an autopsy without blame, <laughs> and and uh, you know we we kind of do the same thing here, and we we do it on the front end when we we facilitate groups that are brainstorming about new solutions or ideas, and we we call it the post mortem. Nice. So you know what what will cause you to uh, cause this to fail, or what will trip us up. Um, so so I like that it it allows us kind of a neutral place to to talk about why things didn't work or won't work. Um, yeah, failure is a big thing and making it OK. Make sure staff understands that there are no bad ideas, that all ideas are valid. Absolutely. Those are all very great. Taking staff to find out, um, talking to staff to find out what they would suggest as an answer to the problem. Absolutely. So you guys are doing a great job of involving your stakeholders and engaging them in the process. I love that. So let's move on. 
um, to number five. Um, Chris, oh, before we yeah. move on, it was one last area around maintaining discipline attention, and it's the point about being distracted and how you have to regain your focus. I mean, I just I don't want us to miss that point because we are pulled in so many different directions. It is so easy to get yep. distracted, uh, and you did that intention. That was a nice um, <laughs> example right. of, how that, a squirrel. Of, of how that can happen. <laughs> um, and so you have to really um, fight against that. You want to maintain um, attention um, because you. it's easy for us, and it's almost human. Oh, you're. Go to that. No. We have to maintain attention and make sure we're doing the the real work. So I just wanted to not miss that point to not allow ourselves to get swept up um, and lose the big picture and, and and be focused on the wrong thing. I know we've all been there that we've been doing the wrong work. So we want to make sure that we're focused on the right work. That's absolutely right, Catherine. Um, and so at this point, you're probably wondering, we've talked a lot about what the leader's doing. And so uh, you might have a little uh, question in your head going off right now that says, uh, so what are our workers doing during these times of change? And so that leads us to number five, which is really giving the work back to the people. And um, so many of you have already shared ways that you engage your workers in the process of change. Um, and those are all great examples of exactly what we're talking about here. Um, and this is really sort of, to just flush this out a little bit, it's to get them to take great re greater responsibility with the work that they have, to get them to take initiative, to offer input and solutions, and to also support them, not control them. Uh, this is about instilling people's confidence so that they can take risks and back them up when they err. And also create communities of learners so that we have that continuous improvement process going on. And it seems appropriate um, that the individuals closest to the work really should be called upon to be the experts, especially when dealing with adaptive challenges. I, I agree, and as a leader, you really want to try to inspire those who are doing the work. Um, you want to support them by involving them, allowing them to be challenged by the problem, and offer solutions. Um, you know, sometimes we try to rescue and um, bring the the problem and the solution, and said, "This is how we're going to get it done." And I'm inviting us to to think about and the work we're trying to get accomplished now, that let's give the problem over to those stakeholders, those closer to the work, and show them that we believe in them and their ability to do it. Now, again, I understand that's a delicate dance um, because we're the supervisor. That's what we get paid to do. I'm sure we heard that from our staff. And so it's about us sh showing, showing up in a way that shows that we are supporting the work but not trying to control them or the work and allowing that creativity to happen, being able to harness that good energy. And we do that by asking questions. We intervene and we support by the questions that we ask. We offer support. We allow them to, um, to take risks. And several of you have talked about that failure factor. That's something that's big with me, that, you know, it's okay to fail as long as we're moving forward. And so we have to create an atmosphere that um, make our staff believe that we really will support them um, when they make a mistake. Not if, but when, because we're doing work differently and inherently in doing something differently, you're going to make mistakes. Um, I found that the more I can embrace that concept, the concept of failing forward, um, it creates an atmosphere where staff feel like they can trust enough to take a risk and that they're going to be supported in that um, process. So as a supervisor, um, we, you know, we're called on to be coaches. Um, we have to be able to create an uh, environment where our staff are willing to support each other and learn from each other and thus 
create a situation that we don't always have to be at the table for the learning to happen because our staff trust the process and they trust us. They know that we support them and that we believe in their ability. Well, and all of that sounds like really good people skills, um, a way of really providing good customer service to your staff, which is what we're asking them to do um, with, with customers in many ways. Um, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and move on to number six and ask for you to provide us feedback with this and number six at the same time in the essence of time. Um, so let's move on to being open to all voices. Uh, listening is really key, and we've heard and seen it several times um, throughout these slides already and those that we went through last week. Um, being open to all voices means that leaders must listen um, to provide cover for employees who speak their truth and avoid the urge to silence unexpected leadership voices. And so why must leaders provide cover to those who speak their truth, Catherine? Can you talk about that? From my experience, um, you know, their workers may be aware of some conflict that I'm not aware of. And this conflict may be essential for me to know in order to be able to intervene appropriately or harness the energy from it to, to, to change the direction of the situation. And so I need to be careful not to shoot the messenger. Um, I think we've all been in those situations. Even if I don't see it that way, even if I didn't realize that, that this was occurring, I need to be open to receiving the information and to be willing um, to listen. Um, and it's hard because often those voices that we hear come from um, unexpected places, um, as the slide shows, or that person's truth is not our truth. And again, I go back to you can hear a person's truth without having to agree with it. So it, it, is, um, it challenges us to, to think differently about being open to different voices. You want to listen for a deeper understanding of what the problem is, what, may, what a potential solution may be. Again, it goes back to we may only be knowing what's above the wave. And this person who is coming to us is under the waters, they're in the current, and they're trying to provide us information. Um, and it's receiving them in a way that they, that they will be open to do that. What I do, and this is just a tool that works for me, in the beginning of those conversations, I ask the person, at the end of our conversation, what do you want to happen? Because I would need to be clear if the person is venting or if this is something that I need to act on. And then based on what they say they want to have happen, I lay out the ground rules in the beginning of that conversation because I want to make sure that we're all clear about what could happen. And I always must tell them if there's something said that makes it impossible for me not to address it, that I have to, but I will work with them on how I go about, how I move forth to make that happen. Um, you know, I just, I just think that's, that's important um, to be able to listen, to respect a person's truth, um, and to be open to that voice that you may not have seen as a leadership voice. Because if you think about early on, we said all voices in the agency um, had leadership potential. We need to be open to that. Absolutely, and I think that's a, um, you've just hit on lots of good things about listening and being open to all voices and gave us some great ideas. Um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and move. Um, we are going to ask you to chime in again on some other things, um, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to do that all at one time and just put up these six strategies of the work of the leader, again, just to give us an overview, um, and to just sort of go back and create the frame a little bit. We've talked about leading from the heart, um, developing and embracing principles and values that make up our changeless core, because this changeless 
um, core is what helps us steady ourselves during these times of rapid and intense complex change. We've talked about technical and adaptive change and really being able to tease out of our challenges what of those are technical and what are adaptive. And for those that are adaptive, really being able to um, work through these six strategies for the work of the leader. And that's what we focus on today. And so we're wondering from you, of these six steps that we discussed today, what do you find most challenging and why? Um, so go ahead and use your chat boxes. And we're just going to pick one or two based on how much time we have left. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, ask for others to chime in on one or two of those as well. So we've got a f couple of folks chatting here. Catherine, what of these six do you find most challenging? Um, I think the regulating um, distress is the one that I find most challenging because I really want to honor um, folk emotions as well as my own and at the f same time recognizing that if we are too emotional about a situation, um, Sometimes we're not able to show up our best and make good judgments. Um, and so being able to honor the person and recognize that we all have emotions and constructively dealing with those emotions so they don't sabotage our ability to move forth is one that I find um, to be challenging at times. So um, I think that lots of folks are in agreement with you. Uh, regulating distress um, as well as being open to all voices seems to be the ones that are popping up here. Um, so let's just take a minute and um, ask for folks, since we've done um, distress already, let's, let's uh, chat in about ways that we have found to be successful to being open to all voices. How do you do it where you work? What, what are some of the tools that work for you? in allowing yourself to be open to all voices. While, while um, folk are typing and thinking about it, I will share that um, that has been a challenge for me. And one of my mentors pointed out to me um, by telling me that he could tell I was not listening and being open to a person that I supervised. Mm. And I pushed back because I had, you know, developed really good um, skills to show I was listening. Um, and he told me he could tell I was not listening because he felt I was too good of a manager to be missing the points that she was making. So clearly, I must not have been listening to her. Mm. And when I really owned what he was saying, I recognized that I wasn't because I viewed her as negative. So each time she talked, I would mentally close down. Uh. And he challenged me to listen to her long enough to pull out one thing that she was saying that I could connect to. That has helped me um, over and over and over again when I'm listening so to someone and I'm trying to push to be open to their voice is to find one thing that they're saying that I can connect to and then I find myself being able to connect to more and more and more. So that's one strategy that I use. It's really about finding the, um, that, that level of common interest, something that you can really, as you say, connect to. Um, and I think that is really key in being open to all voices. It's easy for us to think about being open to all the voices that agree with us. But it's more, much more difficult to think about being open to all voices when there are dissenting opinions or when people bring bad news to us that we really don't want to hear. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, lots of uh, listening and commenting on what is being said is a, is a great, great way to be open to all voices. Uh, Bladen County chats that with our weekly meetings, we listen to our staff. Even if we don't agree, we hear their input. And somebody earlier mentioned just, uh, you know, allowing people to walk into the office and vent about things. You know, that's not what we want to do every day, but it is necessary and sometimes extremely helpful for folks just to feel like they've been heard. 
Um, Kelly says, understand that listening is just not hearing. Absolutely. But watching body language and facial expressions and really getting your clues, being attentive. Yeah. And I think that's what you said earlier, is really attending to the person um, and, and allowing that to drive our ability to be open to all voices. I think being open to all voices is uh, something that also shares a little bit with one of your six principles of partnership, and that is that ability ability to sort of hold judgments lightly, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And let's see, Alice is typing here. Let's see what she says. The pressure is on, Alice. I know, Alice. <laughs> Come on. She's typing fast, I'm sure. Um, all of these things are challenging, and we don't we we don't pretend to sort of um, list them here and talk about them as if they're things that you will race right out and do tomorrow. Um, but we do challenge you to sort of look at them and think. Um, every day focus on what of these can I do today? What one thing um, can I sort of focus on and practice today? Alice says staying connected with your staff. You cannot solve all problems. They need to be heard. That's right. And, and, and feeling like we have to solve all the problems is very stressful in and of itself. So really allowing your, your, you know, self to say, you know, to, to, to just let yourself off the hook about all of that is, is really good. And being upfront and honest and transparent with your staff that you're not going to be able to solve all the problems. Acknowledging that staff are the experts, therefore listening and addressing suge suggestions is crucial. And that really, Laura, is about giving the work back to the people. Perfect. Excellent. We've got about 10 minutes left, and we want to um, get your responses to our uh, next question here. And so I'm going to go ahead and move on. Uh, this is really regarding transfer of learning. So it's really uh, we're asking you, what are you going to take away from what you've heard today? Um, so the question is, what's one way this information will help you with your work? So go ahead and chat with us a little bit about that. One way this, is, this information today um, will help you with your work. What's one thing you're going to focus on when you get back? I'm going to focus on the remote control and the um, oops and ouch. Those are going to be my tools I'm going to carry forward. Oh, Laura says oops and ouch, too. She really liked that. To, to listen even when the comment sounds negative. That's Beautiful. good. And, and seek to understand many. That's, that's really important. Um, see if you can find a common interest or a connection underneath that disagreement. Caroline, be more open and better listener. Uh, taking a, the sandwich analogy to begin that dialogue. Okay, so the sandwich analogy, nice. that's good. Yeah. And the remote control, I know I like that too. That's great. Okay, let's see if we can get a couple more up here. Um, not to let my personal emotions get in the way of problem solving, Megan. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big one for me. Yeah, it's challenging. And important to do though. And important. That's right. And I love that you refer to um, folks that have mentored you, Catherine, and I think that's really key. It's huge, and it's huge, and, and that's something I'm glad that you added. If you can find someone to be that mentor for you, it's, it really um, is invaluable. And so it may be a book. You know, yeah, if you don't right. have someone, you know, it may be a book, it may be um, video clips, but, but just look for your own way to get developed. Again, I go back to especially since most of you said that you are tasked with developing your the leadership in your staff. So look for ways to um, to contribute to yourself. Absolutely. You owe, you owe that to yourself. Find any kind of um, star that you can uh, hitch yourself to, even if it's just somebody that can be a sounding board for you. Um, 
let's see, be mindful of how you show up. I, you know, everybody across the state is now going to use that phrase, Catherine, <laughs> how, how we show up. Oh, I love that. Um, thank you all for that. I'm, I'm going to um, go ahead and just really sort of open this up to question and answers at this time, too. Uh, so if you have any questions of Catherine um, or any comments about the webinar in general, um, please go ahead and chat that now. How you show up. It's a whole new language we're going to speak across the <laughs> state. Okay, somebody from Hartford County is typing. Let's see what they say. We've got about five minutes left. The rose and the thorn is a great tool. If it's good enough for the president's family, I think it's good <laughs> enough for all of us. <laughs> 